Uh, my name is Devin Gill and I'm an AmeriCorps serving with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's West Virginia Field Office. Well, it, it looks a bit like bamboo. It's got these really broad, smooth leaves and these stem joints that are really knobby. And if you look at the branch, it kind of it angles back and forth where the stem joints meet. Uh, it's all pretty green in the spring and the summer, but when I first learned to identify it, uh, that was in the fall. And after the first frost, it takes on this really orange, rusty hue, and it really it pops out against the rest of the landscape. We say it's commonly found along stream banks and roadways, but the amazing thing about Japanese knotweed is that it can grow anywhere. Uh, there have been documented cases of it growing up through, through cement, through tarmac, through flooring and houses, through walls. In West Virginia right now, we're really more concerned about Japanese knotweed, particularly growing up along stream banks. And that's because it has shallower root systems than a lot of the native plants. So it's just not as good at holding in the soil. So it increases the rates of erosion along stream banks, which leads to an increase in the sediment load in the streams, which just um, degrades water quality, which is bad for fish and for mussels. The leaves are of lower nutritional quality than a lot of the native plants. So when the leaves settle to the bottom of the stream, you know, they're eaten by insects and other small organisms, which are in turn eaten by the fish. So this nutritional deficit is carried up the food chain. So eventually you could see uh, fewer populations of fish just because the habitat isn't as, as viable. Well, Japanese knotweed spreads vegetatively, which means that it doesn't need to be pollinated in order to reproduce, which creates all kinds of problems. Um, so all you need is a little bit of plant material to be transported from one place to the next, and you could have a whole new infestation. Um, this makes it really sensitive to uh, different flooding and hurricane type events. Like uh, we've seen this year, uh, all kinds of different flooding events across the United States. Um, coming to mind right now is like Vermont, Iowa, uh, Louisiana, and um, these states have actually had to develop like Japanese knotweed management plans because it's the only thing that's growing back and these flooding events are just spreading it all over the place and they're realizing like holy cow this is really a powerful plant. It just, it takes over. Hi, I'm Clark Owen. I'm from Elkins, West Virginia. I work for the Nature Conservancy as the CWPMA uh, field crew leader. There's a two-step approach. Um, we, in late summer, we uh, cut down the Japanese knotweed to about 18 inches. Uh, and then we let it grow back for four to six weeks. At that point, it'll usually grow back to about between 36 and 40 inches. And the reason we do that is to get it to a manageable height. Late summer, when a Japanese knotweed is most susceptible to herbicides, it can be up to 10 to 12 feet tall. And that poses a safety risk for applying herbicides because you're spraying above your head. We spray it with a, an aquatic approved herbicide um, with the active ingredient of glyphosate. And we do a foliar spray. After that, uh, in two to three weeks, it'll start showing signs of yellowing and reddening and uh, that herbicide is then translocated to the roots and, uh, and gives it a pretty good kill rate. Um, this is a tough weed to kill and it usually can take more than one season to fully uh, eradicate the plant. When we're cutting it down it's just about to bloom but when we cut the plant it we're uh, causing it not to be able to bloom that year and create seeds as well. So it's kind of a two-step, you know, we're doing a mechanical removal of all the flowering heads and then we're spraying after that. So it doesn't have a chance to go to seed at all that year. Um, that is another control method is if you do continually mow the plant every two weeks for um, a couple se a season or two, you will um, use up all that uh, root energy in the form of starches in the, those roots. For my field crew, that's a lengthy and time-consuming, labor-intensive method. But for an average homeowner who has one or two patches of sm small, like six, eight-foot-long patches, uh, then you know that's something completely doable to go out there with the weed whacker and mow it down every two weeks. 
um, while they're doing the, the rest of their lawn or something. And you know, that way they don't have to worry about any chemical control at all. I think as a fly fisherman, um, I need a lot of room to cast. And as these plants really start to encroach along the river borders, I lose a lot of flies to Japanese knotweed. And uh, as I tie my own flies, so I put a lot of time and effort crafting each one of those flies. And to lose one just is like, oh, that's like a couple minutes, you know, that's like 10 minutes out of my life that I spent making that one fly to help hopefully catch a few fish. And the Japanese knotweed ate it. And trying to find that fly amongst that thicket tangle of Japanese knotweed is almost impossible. It's like a needle in a haystack. Ha <laughs> ha.